Good morning, church. How you doing? Fantastic. Would you stand up? We are going to sing. We're going to praise God together. So happy you're here today. It's a glorious day, amen? Jesus this morning. Amen. We serve an unstoppable God. Amen.
unstoppable.
goodness of God all my life. this story both on the uh, internet and the national news so it's got to be true right uh, Trisha Summers was a 46 year old single mom of an 8 year old boy named Wesley 
She was in the hospital and just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Her nurse, also named Tricia, had been told time and time again that she was a wonderful nurse and had a great bedside manner, but she had never been told quite like this. The day that Summers was uh, about to be released out of the hospital, she asked the question, would you take my son if I die? Now, the Siemens, Tricia Seaman was her name, they were actually in the process of becoming foster parents. So she was flabbergasted at the time and didn't have the words to say, but she went home, talked it over with her family, and they took Wesley as their own. been about eight years and Wesley's 16 now with his learner's permit and from time to time his mom had left him little gifts to remind her remind him of her love for him and this time on the 16th birthday birthday she left him a key ring and on it were the words drive safely love mom before dying, Jesus left us something to remember him by on special occasions like today. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to, through 26, Paul writes, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. These emblems are reminders on this special occasion of what Jesus did for us we choose to follow Christ and we've been adopted into his family let's pray dear God we just thank you for the many blessings you give us for what your son did for us dying on the cross and taking our punishment for our sins and adopting us into your family in Christ's name we pray amen Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come together, to hear the word preached, to sing songs of praise to your name, and to give back a portion of what you've given us to live on. Pray for the folks who couldn't make it today, for those who have storm damage, that you would give them the help they need. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Good morning. I'm glad you're able to be out today and didn't get blown away. It's a rough, rough weekend. Everybody doing okay? Ready for preaching? All right, well, let's do that. Have a Bible look at Exodus chapter 3. I'll be there in just a moment. We're looking at a series I call Free at Last. Free at Last. Thank God Almighty, I am free at last. I don't do it very well, but you're, you're, getting, you're catching on. You'll get there. Look at the similarity as God leads the people of Israel out of Egypt, <clears throat> out of bondage, into freedom. And our lives sometimes are bound by things. We'll look at some of those as we come along. But right now, we're looking at the call of God on Moses' life to lead the people out. And, of course, we looked at Exodus 3.10 last week. God said, come on, Moses. And, but before he does that, before God ever calls you to do anything, and he's calling you to do something, Okay, God has designs on your life. I said, God has designs on your life. He wants you to do something. <laughs> Just a little nod of agreement, and I'll go on. Yeah. God wants you to do something. Before he does that, he'll always tell you who he is. He gives enough revelation of himself that it makes sense to obey him. So he starts by telling Moses, take your shoes off because I'm holy, and God is holy. And then he says, I'm the God of your father, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He is faithful. Looked at that. And then he says, probably the most surprising thing, I've heard your cries, I've seen your oppression, and I'm tenderhearted, and I care about you. And Moses says, hey, that's all great, but who am I to lead Israel? I, I'm not the right guy. I, and we'll look next week at, by the way, this is travel season. It has kicked off right now, and we have all these ser services are online. Please take advantage of this because you need these, these sermons. I, I Trust me, I think you do. I know I need them. Next week is a bit... Got any excuses why you can't serve God? Well, Moses had plenty. And I think God will do the same thing with yours he did with Moses. He'll answer you and just say, it's time to buck up. But before he says, when he says, who am I? And then God says, I'll be with you. I'll help you do this. And then in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, here's the second protest Moses makes. If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of our ancestors has sent me to you, they'll ask me, what's his name? And then what should I tell them? I need to know your name. <clears throat> Names are important. Uh, if you, they're so important that people need to understand. It makes you feel loved and appreciated if somebody knows your name. I was in Sunday school class with my dad. My dad preached in the same church for 40-some years. And he said, all right, Hank, I want you to read. I thought, that guy's name is not Hank. But dad can remember anybody's name. When you get old, I think you just give him a pass. You know, all right, Hank, and whoever Hank was and everybody was Hank, they, <clears throat> my name was not Hank. I've been called a lot of things. When I was in junior high, I have a few memories of that period of time. I had a geography teacher, and when she'd see me in the hall, she, she would always say, hi there. I don't know if she knew my name or not. Now, I know if you're teaching, you probably got 150 kids, you got to know names of them, but I mean, I came to school every day, sat in the same place every day in an assigned seat, <clears throat> not of my choosing, and I, she thought my name was there, so I just tried re replying to her. Hi there. I guess everybody's, I, but I really, I, I, even as a junior high kid, it kind of, <clears throat> kind of made me feel bad. Now, the flip side of this is, is rough because I'm not near as good with names as I wish I were. And I, I'm looking around, I know a lot of people's names, but, I, and I, and, but please don't ask me. Sometimes we'll have somebody come up, like Baby Dedication Sunday, and I'll go, and I, I've known these people for 12 years. You know, I, I knew them, and, and, but right now the name just, shoo, that, no, that happened. Anybody, that happened to anybody else? Okay. I, I, I'm really working to know your names. I want, to, I want to know people. I think names are important. I, think, I wish I were better at it. When I was in, in college, Russell Boltman was the dean of our college, first day of class, introduction to Bible study. He called the role. There were 66 freshmen that year, one for each book of the Bible. And he called the role by memory. And he knew something about you, where you're from, and your parents' name. And I was pretty impressed. And he said, we had a system. And if you look over here, look at that part of the room, you think of this and that. I couldn't remember the system, let alone the names that went with the system. I got another friend, Lynn Laughlin, who was part of Lincoln Christian College for years. He was a, a teacher, basketball coach. I was in camp with Lynn several times when I was a kid and as an adult. And a great guy. Lynn knows everybody's name. And he's seen people come through that college for 50 years. And if, they, if you've ever been around there, he, if you met him once, he knows you. I don't, I don't know how to do that. I, I wish I could. It, it, so I struggle, and sometimes I forget names. Sometimes if I see you in the wrong place, I am not any better with faces than I am names. Anybody else? Fact is, I'm better at names than I am faces, which is a, 
anomaly. It's just part of the weirdness that makes me who I am. <clears throat> By the way, Lynn Laughlin always calls me Marcus, which that's part of his memory too. I guess that, that works. I'm afraid I have occasion to hurt people's feelings by not knowing somebody's name. Now, if, if I hurt your feeling by not being able to call your name, could I just say, I am so sorry, and I'm trying, but I have a very limited intellectual capacity. <laughs> it is just about full. I need a new hard drive, it looks like. I think God is bothered when we don't treat his name and the value of knowing it as a privilege. It is a privilege to know his name. And God's already revealed a lot about himself in Exodus chapter 3, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they wondered, I think, Moses wondered. Now, because they believed in localized gods, at least the people in Egypt did, they had all these gods, hundreds of gods. They thought, well, you know, it was fine. Yeah, you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but if we go back to Canaan, you'll be in charge. But we're in Egypt, and are you really the God down here in Egypt as well? They're going to ask me who I'm talking about, and I've got to have a name. So who is this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And by the way, we could have, I thought this passage was so important, we'd just give one Sunday to it. Uh, so verses 14 and 15, God answers the question. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Now, I don't know if you read any Dr. Seuss when you're a kid or not, but that does sound like Dr. Seuss, does it not? Sam, I am. And maybe that's Dr. Seuss was a believer, I think, maybe. Maybe he got it. But he says, I am who I am. Say to this people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, which is a translation of I am, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. I am is my name. It's a personal name of God, and it is used, you're going to be surprised, 6,823 times. You didn't know that. Congratulations. That's a lot of times. In the Old Testament, this personal name of God is used. Now, we don't know how to pronounce it because to the Jews, the name of God was so precious that they would not say it out loud. In fact, if, when the scribes were, were writing and copying the Bible, before they wrote the name I am, they would actually take a bath first, and then when they got done writing, they'd break the pen. I mean, they, they, to them, the name was, was so holy. Now, we pronounce it Jehovah. Here's, it, actually, I am is like four consonants. And Hebrew is a little different language, okay? But four consonants. And then they took the, the vowels from Adonai, which means Lord, stuck it in the consonants and come up with, a long time ago, we called it Jehovah, called this name Jehovah. And now, usually, it's called uh, Yahweh, but one of those two names. And that's just a translation, the best we have. Now, again, the name was so holy to the Jews that when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, have I lost you yet? Okay, don't check out. Don't, don't go away. Okay. When they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, it's called the Septuagint version, instead of translating it Jehovah or Yahweh, a literal translation, they translated it with the word Lord, but a capital L and O-R-D in small caps. Now, in your, in your English Bible, when you read the Old Testament and you see capital L and in small caps O-R-D, you're reading the name Jehovah, Yahweh, or I Am. It, that is the name of God in the Old Testament that he gives Moses on this day for this occasion. Now, only one Bible I know of, actually two, but just one that's very popular, that, ha that translates instead of Lord, translates to Jehovah or Yahweh, is the 1901 American Standard Version. Anybody have that one? I didn't think so. So as you read the Old Testament, remember when you see, it, see the word type that way, we're talking about Jehovah, Yahweh, I am. When you say hallelujah, you're saying praise Yahweh. Now at some point in any relationship, we have to learn somebody's name and when you learn the name, it's an, when you give your name, it's an invitation to know me better. I love the old, old joke, and it is old, and you'll know why, because young man and young woman were, were talking and flirting around a little bit, and finally he says to her, hey, could I have your phone number? And she said, sure, it's in the book. That's why you know it's an old story, because there's no phone book anymore. I, there is, but no, I don't know what's in there. <laughs> she said, yeah, my, my number's in the book. He said, great, and, and what's your name? And she said, it's in the book, too, right by my number. So there, there you go. <laughs> Which means, no, thank you. We've known each other about as well as we're going to know each other. But God says to Moses, I do want you to know me. Here's my name. Use it. Now, two questions this morning. What's in the name? Why is it so special? And then what, what difference does that make to us? First of all, why is it so special that we know this name of God? Exodus chapter 6. Turn over one page in your Bible. Again, God speaking with Moses. The Lord said to Moses, now you'll see what I will do to Pharaoh. When he feels the force of my strong hand, he'll let the people of Israel go. 
In fact, he will force him to leave this land. And God said to Moses, I am Yahweh. And I'm reading the New, New Living Translation, which does a little better than some others as far as the name of God's concerned. God said to Moses, I am Yahweh, the Lord. Now, I see, see L-O-R-D, and hopefully, did we get, we lost the capitals. Okay. And, that, and, and that, that for that, I'll blame someone else. But who knows? <laughs> But, it, but if you read your Bible there, it's capital L and then O-R-D are small caps. I am the Lord. What verse was that? Verse 2? Verse 3, here we go. I, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, or God Al- Almighty, but I did not reveal my name, Yahweh, to them. Now, when he says I did not reveal my name to them, it wasn't that they'd never heard the name Yahweh or Jehovah. Could I just tell you, this is going to be a little more scholarly than most of our sermons. Okay, so stick with me. They're, they're, it, you need this. Okay, and... And Moses needed. And so he says, um, I've, not used, I've not given this name before to use. But in, they did hear the name before. In Genesis 4.26, Holman Christian Standard Bible translates this. At that time, the people began to call on the name of Yahweh. So in the fourth chapter of Genesis, there are, the name is already known, but not really understood. In fact, remember, you, you know the story well of Abraham and Isaac, and Isaac's being offered as a sacrifice, and God sends a, a ram to be caught there, and and then, remember what uh, Abraham says? I'm going to call this place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. So they, they knew the name, but they didn't really understand the name. In fact, later on, and this is centuries later, Jeremiah 16, God says, Now I will show them my power, I will show them my might. At last they will know and understand that I am Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord. So what do, we, what do we understand by the name I am or Yahweh? Number one, I am means God is eternal. Everything I know has a beginning and an end, including this sermon. And I like it that way. Okay? I, I like things that start and finish, and that's all I know about. But God, the I am, Jehovah, Yahweh is forever eternal. S- Psalm 90, Moses again writes, Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is, who was, and is to come, the Almighty. He's the eternal one. He has always been and always will be. And that ought to be apparent to us. Romans 1.20, Paul writes, since the creation of the world, the divine attributes of God is power, eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, we are without excuse. So the eternality of God is something that ought to be obvious. Psalm 46 starts this way, God is our refuge and strength. He's a very present help in trouble. And though the mountains shift and the earthquakes come, though the storms roll through town, God is a rock. He never changes. He's always going to be there. Think about a college athlete who gets ready to sign a letter of intent, national letter of intent he's going to play or she's going to play at this next place, school to go. And that student athlete has to be wondering when they sign, will this coach be here when I graduate? I went to... When I went to college, we had four different basketball coaches in four years. That's a sign of a fabulous basketball program. Okay. If you went there because this coach is here, you made a mistake because he's not going to be there very long. But God Almighty is always there. Isaiah 26, you'll keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord, Yahweh, always, for Yahweh, God, is the eternal rock. Deuteronomy 33 Eternal God is a dwelling place. Underneath are the everlasting arms. We used to have a, we, we have a hymn we sing that goes, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on those everlasting arms. In Proverbs 18, 10, the name of the Lord, Yahweh, is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. And so the fact that he is I am, it means God is eternal, also means he's the source of all meaning. He's the one who gives life meaning. Every other title God has, is God in relationship to somebody else. So he's creator, we're creation. He is the sustainer of life, we have life. He's the provider, we're provided for. But he is the I am, self-existent one, uncaused, who alone gives life meaning. Now I've got a picture for you, and I don't know if you can see this very well or not. Isn't that a beautiful picture? You go, what in the world is this? It's over here too. What in the world is that? It ain't much, right? That, 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 that picture is called pale blue dot. Taken in 1990 from Voyager 1 space probe. Uh, that's a picture of the Earth from 3.7 billion miles away, give or take a mile or two. Okay. Now, 
here's what Carl Sagan, the famous physicist, wrote about this picture. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who's ever lived has lived their lives here. Our posturing, our self-imagined importance, the illusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this little pale light. Our planet is, a listen to this, just a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there's no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save, our, save us from ourselves. So to me, he says, he concludes, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another, preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Isn't that heartwarming? That's it. You're, you're, you're just, that, look, that speck is gone. That little speck up there. That's where you live. And you're just a minute little part of that. And if you think you're important, you have sad, you're sadly mistaken. So be nice to people and take care of the pale blue dot. Anybody else see the problem with that? What he's saying is you've got to make up your own meaning. And for one, it's be nice to people and take care of the blue dot. For somebody else, it's get all you can because it's not going to be very long. For one, it's give it away and be generous. The other person is collect it for yourself. For one, it is end racism. For another... Just go into a grocery store and shoot all the black folks you can. You got, see, who's to say whose morality is right or wrong? But meaning comes. And it is, it's because I am, God says. I am Jehovah. I am Yahweh. I am. I always have been. I always will be. He is the source of all meaning for us. And the good news is he never changes. You can bank on his promises. He's absolutely faithful. We sang about it to his announced purposes. He said it over and over again to Moses, I will do it again because I am Yahweh. I am that I am. Hebrews 1, verse 12, you'll fold them up, talking about the heavens, like a cloak. you discard them like old clothing, but you're always the same. You'll live forever. God doesn't change even when we're fickle. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Listen to these couplets. There's a trustworthy statement. If we die with him, we'll live with him. If we do a hardship, we reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. But if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. He cannot deny who he is. Lloyd Douglas, a long time ago, was an author. He wrote The Robe. When he was in college, he was living in a boarding house. And he had a routine. Every morning he'd get up and go to school, uh, he would yell out to the retired music teacher who was wheelchair bound in the basement apartment. He would yell out to him, what's the good word today? And the old music teacher would take a tuning fork and bang it on the wheelchair and say, that, my friend, is middle C. So the tenor upstairs is flat. The piano next door is out of tune, but that is middle C. It always has been, and it always will be. You want some security? It doesn't come from anything here. It comes from knowing that God never changes. So he's eternal, source of meaning, and he never changes. Now, what difference does that make? Glad you asked. Verse 16. Let me read a little more from Exodus 3. Now go and call together all the elders of Israel, after you've just given them his name. Tell them the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me. He told them, I've been watching closely. I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I promise to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to the land flowing with milk and honey, the land where all these other tribes now live. I am as no local deity. He will prove it in Egypt. That He reigns in Canaan. He reigns in Egypt. He reigns here as well. So what is your Egypt? What, what is the place in your life that's lasted so long and has been so bad for so long? And you think, God can't make any difference. Can I just tell you that God reigns in that area? I don't care if it's family. I don't care if it's school. I don't care if it's work. God reigns over everybody and every place. Verse 18, he goes on. The elders of Israel will accept your message. Then you and the elders must go to the king of Egypt and tell him, the Lord, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So please let us take a three-day journey in the wilderness, offer sacrifices to Yahweh, our God. But I know the king of Egypt will not let you go unless I, a mighty hand forces him. So... I'll raise my hand and strike the Egyptians, performing all the kind of miracles among them, the plagues. Then at last, he will let you go. Since he is I am, that means there's no one who can resist his purposes. What person could possibly stand between God and his purposes? Who's your Pharaoh? Who is it that would stand in that way? Don't let anybody who once was not and soon will not be take the place of God stand. You, you think... You think God is limited by Vladimir Putin? Putin? Now, Putin thinks he's king of the world right now. Okay? He thinks it's his prerogative to just take the next country and the next and all that. 
I, fr frankly, I watch the news. Uh, nobody's really, uh, what are we going to do? Here's my only political comment of the day. Are you ready? If you don't agree with it, you're free to have your other opinion. I think the man's nuts. I think he's nuts. And if, if somebody said, well, he, he would never shoot off a nuclear weapon. Well, you got a lot of confidence in him. I don't have that kind of confidence in him. I think he's nuts. Oh, so a little worried about Putin. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm a little worried about that. Is that a problem for God? Pharaoh was no problem for God. And neither is Putin. No man stands between God and his purposes. Verse 21, here's how the chapter ends. I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably on you. They'll give you uh, gifts, parting gifts. When you'll <laughs> this is funny, by the way. I'm going to give you parting gifts. When you, you will not leave empty-handed. Every year's like woman will take articles of silver and gold and find clothing from her Egyptian neighbors, from the foreign women in their houses. You will dress your sons and daughters with these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. He said, it, it, it's not, there's no problem. Since he is I am, there's no need, no problem he cannot meet. And we have great needs. And I've been, I've been, I watch the news. I try to limit myself. And I'm trying to watch even less now. I heard a new, new, new term on the news yesterday called stagflation. It's when the economy is stagnant, but yet there's inflation. How does that happen? What, and what do you do? And how can you overcome that? And I don't know. But I know this. There is no problem that's too big for our God. He can meet all those needs. They may seem overwhelming, but he's in charge. There's no place, no person, no need that he can't meet. Now, I'm going to conclude this with this. Philippians 2.9. And i got about four more minutes when I say conclude. Don't go away. Therefore, God elevated him, that's Jesus, to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. What name do you suppose God gives Jesus? Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? Now, the name Jesus means Jehovah saves. When Jesus was walking on the water one night and the disciples were out there and they are completely terrified when they see him walking up. Your English Bible, they're, they're spooked and Jesus says, don't be afraid. Your English Bible says, don't be afraid, it is I. You know what it really says, what the Greek says? Don't be afraid. I am. In John chapter 8, the Pharisees are after Jesus because he's been teaching and claiming that he's somebody, that he is God, and they can't stand it. And he says, Abraham, you claim to follow Abraham? Well, Abraham, rejoice to see my day. And they said, you're not even 50 years old. How could you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. You know what he's claiming? I, I'm God. I am eternal God. And they picked up rocks to throw at him because they knew he was, they thought, blaspheming the name of God. There are seven statements in the Gospel of John where Jesus uses this combination of I am. But and it's a still a little weak in the English because the English says, I am the bread of life. What he says is, I, I myself am. I am. I, I am. Let me read those statements for you. I am. Jesus says, I am the bread of life that comes from heaven. Those who eat from me will never hunger. I, I am the light of the world. He that follows me will never walk in darkness. I, I am the door. If any man enters through me, he'll be saved. I, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. I, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though we're dead, he'll still, he shall still live. I, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. I, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. And Jesus said in John 8, 24, if you don't believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. Proverbs 18, Holman Christian Standard Bible translates it. The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they're protected and they are safe. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the introduction to yourself that you are willing to share your name with Moses and with us. And Father, we believe that you are, that you always were, that you always will be. We don't understand much about that, but it gives us great security. Help us to run to that righteous place, to your name, where there's safety. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now the New Testament, would you stand please? We're going to sing just a moment. The New Testament never uses the name Yahweh. Isn't that odd? Isn't that not? But the concept is all over. It all points to Jesus. Let's sing.
Good morning, Parkview. Hey, I have a few announcements for you. The first being the high school canoe trip is coming up on May 19th through the 22nd. This is a adventurous trip. You should be interested. And if you are, talk with Brian Heimer. Tonight, the high schoolers are going to Don Roberts house for the end of the year cookout 2022. This is going to be a climactic event. People may hurl themselves into the pond. We don't know, but we are leaving from the church at four o'clock and we should be back around eight. Make sure to be there. Attention, students in Sunday school. Next week, you will be moving up to the next Sunday school class because you're graduated and you're older now. So make sure next week not to go to the wrong place. Also next week, we will be having our Parkview 101 class. If you are interested in learning more about Parkview and what we are about, make sure to see Mark Richardson today. And that's all I got for you guys this week. We will see you next week.